of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple. Truly, I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. After three consecutive Sundays, we've finally come to the end of the 10th chapter of Matthew's Gospel a journey that began three weeks ago at the very end of chapter nine, with Jesus proclaiming the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. As it turns out, these laborers of which Jesus spoke were, in fact, the 12 disciples named in the opening verses of chapter 10. And their labor was, in fact, to be missionaries and messengers, apostles of the one sending them forth, Jesus who was himself sent by God, the one he called Father. It is what one commentator I read earlier this week referred to as a chain of mission. A chain of mission. As the Father sends the Son, so the Son sends the disciples. Thematically, it is an idea more often associated with John's gospel. We hear this kind of language in John very frequently of the Father and the Son being one and Jesus's followers being one in him and him and the Father and so forth. But we see in today's reading from Matthew that this idea, this oneness idea in the Father and the Son and the disciples was an idea that was remembered and more importantly taught in Matthew's community as well. You know, it's a helpful exercise, and we do well to remember that the words written in the Gospels were written for actual people, actual communities of actual Christians in the ancient world who were actually trying to live lives as actual followers of Jesus. Matthew, 
along with the other gospel writers, John, Mark, Luke, along with several other non-canonical gospel writers, those whose gospels uh, didn't make the cut, as it were, to be included uh, in the Bible. All of their writings were written with such actual people in mind, actual followers of Christ who needed to hear the message and to remember the things that Jesus did and said and taught and passed along to the disciples so that they could in turn pass along to others. And while you and I like to think sometimes that the words of the Gospels are primarily for our own edification and encouragement as followers of Christ, and to be fair, they are. They are there for our own benefit. The truth is, Matthew and the others could never have imagined the likes of you and me, and the likes of the world in which we now live, much less the church we have now become. Nonetheless, ideas such as the chain of mission had relevance they gained traction with our faith forebears of long ago. In part, such an idea had relevance and gained a foothold in the thinking of early Christians, scholars tell us, because it was a way of communicating what I'm calling this chain of mission it was a way of communicating in the ancient world that was understood and accepted across cultures, and across class. In other words, to send one's representatives was in essence to send oneself. Likewise, to receive and welcome the representatives of another person was in essence to receive and welcome that person. It was a sign of respect and of hospitality. And it gave credence to whatever the messengers, the representatives, had to say on behalf of the one who had sent them. It's sort of an ancient world equivalent of, oh, I don't know, getting an email from someone that you know is legitimate versus one that you know is not. Most of you know, I learned this lesson the hard way earlier in the week when Early in the morning, I started getting messages from my parishioners and colleagues and others wanting to verify that a suspicious email that they had received was in fact not from me. Or was it from me? Most realized that it was a scam of some kind. My email had been hacked. People could tell from the tone of the message, that doesn't sound like Earl. Not to mention that the email address connected with it was not my email address. That this message was one that they should not welcome nor receive, the, well, they received it, but it is not one that they should keep. It needed to go directly into their spam folder. So what does it mean 
for you and for me to recognize that to be welcomed or received in the name of Christ, the one who sends us, is in essence the act of receiving and welcoming Christ himself. Let me suggest a few takeaways that I think are worth our consideration. First of all, this idea of the chain of mission. Let us not forget, we're just the messengers. It's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about me. It is rather about the one who sends us, Jesus, the Christ. Always has been, always will be. Recognizing this truth helps us to set aside the things that so often distract, distracting us from our true mission, our real purpose, which is supposed to be, in one way or another, telling others about the good news of God's love in Jesus, a love so great that, as Paul put it, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from that love. We're just the messengers, just the messengers. Secondly, when we get caught up in things being about us, well, that's a sure sign that our ego is in charge. And if our egos are calling the shots, we can rest assured that we're living and acting and speaking out of a false sense of self rather than speaking as messengers of Jesus, as those speaking out of their child of God self, our follower of Christ self. The beauty of the idea of a chain of mission is that it is inherently, by definition, about the body, the community. No single person, no single part of the body, no single entity, no single ego can make up the chain of mission. It is a chain. It requires links to be a chain. It requires a willingness of each link in the chain to willingly bind itself to the other links for the sake of the greater good. Lastly, I think it's worth remembering why an idea such as the chain of mission would have given the early community of Christians to whom Matthew was writing, why such an idea would have given them hope. No doubt, by the time Matthew wrote this gospel, which is estimated by scholars to be sometime around the sixth century of uh, excuse me, the sixth decade of the first century. By that time, the people of Matthew's community would have known about the experiences of the 12 disciples and other early missionaries and apostles 
the, the stories of those experiences would have been known within the fledgling Christian movement. The stories of saints and martyrs, of ones who left to take part, to take their part in the chain of mission, but who were never heard from again. Those stories would have been known. Words such as those found in our gospel reading would have offered hope. A reminder that disciples find welcome and reception on their journeys into the world, into the harvest. Yes, they went out like sheep into the midst of wolves. But they went out into a world that also received the message. The message that they bore to that world found welcome and reception on the ears and in the hearts of people, real people. Those that shared that message in Matthew's world or those that share that message still in our own can take hope that the prophet's reward, the reward of the righteous, indeed like a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, is what awaited them and what awaits us still. You know, at times we become cynical and desperate, believing the world to be hopelessly lost and at best indifferent to the message of the gospel. At times we can believe that our efforts to be the church and to proclaim the gospel are done so in vain and that no one is buying what we're selling. We fall prey especially in times such as those that were the times we're living in now to believe that the world is well on its way to being completely unhinged people torn apart in more ways than we can count and it is in such moments that we are sorely tempted to give in to the sin of individualism we make me, my, and I, our favorite pronouns. Or even if we do make use of we, our, and us, it is only done in a selective sense, more about who we find it necessary to exclude rather than include. As we are reminded in the collect for today, let us always pray fervently, grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit, dare I say, in a chain of mission that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you, O God. And may the chain of mission not only not be broken, but may it grow, may it thrive, may it be strengthened with each new link that is added. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.